waiting for the stream to fire up across the internet. And it looks like we're getting going on Periscope. Facebook is up. Facebook is up again in the Watching the Watchers group. We're just waiting on YouTube, which usually takes a minute. And it looks like we're live there as well. Hello, everybody. Welcome back to yet another episode of Watching the Watchers Live. My name is Robert Gruler. I am a criminal defense attorney here in Scottsdale, Arizona, over here at the R&R Law Group. And my team and I, over the course of many years, we've helped thousands of good people facing criminal charges navigate through the criminal justice system and help really get their lives you know, back on the right path. Unfortunately, in our experience, we've seen a lot of good people that just are, you know find themselves in difficult positions and they need some assistance and that's what we help them do now over the course of those years in practice we have seen all sorts of malfeasance misconduct a lot of problems permeating our criminal justice system and we started watching the watchers live in order to hold those people accountable i'm talking about a lot of the stuff that we see every day on the news stuff that is all throughout our nation in 2020 we're seeing misconduct involving police we're seeing uh, just major problems with prosecutors. We're going to talk about a couple of them today. We've got mis, you know, malfeasance from judges, and we've just got problems all throughout our entire justice system that we want to correct. We want to hold those people who are in charge of this system accountable, and that's what this show is really all about. It's about having rational conversations. It's about talking about and prioritizing freedom, and it's about holding those who are in power, those in charge, those are, who are supposed to be the people are responsible for our functioning society. We want to make sure that they're held accountable as well. And so today we're going to be talking more about all of those things, of course, because 2020 elections, those are finally coming to a close. That is all taking place tomorrow, November 3rd, Tuesday, November 3rd. We've been waiting for this day for a long time and it is finally here. We're going to know who the next president is. It could be a new president. It could be the same as the old president. But, you know, you may be wondering, what, what does an election have to do with watching the watchers or with, you know, criminal justice? Well, a lot, basically everything, right? Uh, for a long time on this channel, if you're not a subscriber, if you haven't been following along, please go ahead and do that. But we've been talking about how all of this stuff is going to trickle down and impact each and every one of us from from our, our you know taxes, from the legal uh, mechanisms that are in place in our society that help you know sculpt our behavior. Of course, those things are going to be in play. But we're also talking about you know criminal justice issues that are really going to impact a huge portion of the country. And even though a lot of the you know a lot of people are talking about you know issues like abortion or you know environmental stuff or coronavirus or economic stuff on a on a daily basis we have the ability to create our criminal justice system in a way that we can't do so with some other things, right? With climate change, for example, it's difficult for the United States to take the bull by the horns and dictate how the entire globe is going to comply with how we want them to run the climates. But a justice system, our criminal justice system, it's in the United States. It's within our total control. We can do everything about that. We can just you know, pass a bill with the stroke of a pen, change how this whole thing works. And oftentimes a lot of people sort of forget about that and just how important this stuff is. I'm not saying that climate change or abortion aren't important, but a lot of that stuff is a little bit more sort of esoteric. It's kind of out there, whereas what we're talking about here with justice reform is here and now. Somebody's going to prison or they're not. Somebody's getting arrested or they're not. And so a lot of this stuff will trickle down from the top, and I've been covering a lot of it on this channel, specifically about the criminal justice records for both of these candidates, Donald Trump and Joe Biden. And we've talked about it a lot here. Donald Trump, in my opinion, somebody who is you know, a little bit more sort of progressive, at least in terms of historical context, than the other candidates. I'm talking about the First Step Act, which we had some time on this channel dissecting a little bit. By contrast, on the other side of the aisle, we have Joe Biden, who is the author of the 1994 crime bill and a co-sponsor of a number of other crime and, and justice related bills throughout the 80s and 90s, who's being supported, sort of flanked by Kamala Harris, who is a former attorney general, former prosecutor from the state of California. So on the one hand, when it comes to justice reform and justice related issues, you've got Donald Trump, who's on the record with the First Step Act, which is really trying to improve the justice system 
to the benefit of a lot of defendants helping people get out of custody earlier, providing more mechanisms for them to communicate with their families and helping them integrate back into society. Versus on the other side of that, we've got a lot of new proposals. We have a lot of promises from Joe and Kamala, but we don't have much of a record. Instead, from both of them, we have this long history of putting people in prison. I call Joe Biden the godfather of mass incarceration because I cannot think of another politician in the United States alive who has done more to support the mass incarceration of people than Joe Biden has. And like I said, he's very supported by Kamala Harris. So you can sort of figure out from that little introductory rant where I stand on this election. But my point is, this stuff is going to trickle down to real people. We're not talking about esoteric things anymore. This is something that's going to start at the top. So of course, Joe Biden, Donald Trump, the presidency, very, very important to the future of, of you know, how this is all going to unfold. And similarly, we're going to see that a lot of the states around the country also have very important local elections and very important state elections that are also going to contribute to the future development of how we consider and how we handle justice in the United States. And so we're going to go through all of that today. We have a lot on the plate, uh, uh, really not much else to talk about the day before the election other than the election stuff. And so as soon as the election's over, we are going to sort of, you know, kind of wind this thing back into more of the criminal justice stuff uh, if, uh, with, a, with a high focus on that. But for the time being, we do need to get sorted through all of this election stuff. Now, again, here we've been covering a lot about how the mechanics of the election are going to work. So specifically, when are election deadlines? When are the mail-in ballot deadlines? What lawsuits are taking place that are going on throughout the country as we speak? I mean, literally on a daily basis, and not so much today, but last week we saw a lot of cases that were working their way up to the Supreme Court. A lot of these other cases that were being dealt with in local state Supreme Courts and district courts all surrounding the issue of, on how is this election going to work because we have coronavirus, we have a lot of different interested parties who are um, you know, filing lawsuits and trying to move things around sort of at the last minute, but how is it all going to unfold tomorrow? So the biggest question that I had when I started thinking through some of this stuff is, are we going to know the results at the end of the day tomorrow? Are we, you know, by 8 p.m. or whenever it is you go to bed, are we going to have an idea on who the next president is going to be. And there are really a couple you know, a couple different questions there. Number one, when are the deadlines by which the states are supposed to have all of their incoming ballots? So many people like us in Arizona, all of our ballots are due on election night. By tomorrow night, they should all be in. If they're not in, there's gonna be you know no counting of those ballots. Uh, as far as I know. Now, again, you know, there's there's a lot of details here, so so bear with me as we go through a lot of different states, a lot of different rules. But my point is, is there are some states that say the election is the election. It's that day. That's it. Get them in by that day or they don't count. There's other states that have pushed the election deadlines beyond that. So literally beyond the election day, we're going to see here that in North Carolina, they have another nine days after the election day. So tomorrow on the third, that's not the end of it for them. They are still going to be collecting and counting ballots for the remaining nine days until they have a final total number. Now, North Carolina may not be pivotal in this election, but it very well could be. And it is considered one of the battleground states that we're going to cover today. So North Carolina is nine days out. Pennsylvania is another three, day out, three days out. Pennsylvania is going to be another big issue. And if that is not a landslide, we may see a lot more litigation taking place there. So not only that, the, the first question is about when are the actual deadlines? But the second question is, well, when are they going to start counting these things? And are they going to have them counted in time? So there, there are some states where the deadline is, is soon, but they're not going to have the resources to actually count the votes in time. So those votes are going to be sitting in a bin somewhere, and then they're going to be counting them over the next coming days. So those are pretty two big, you know, big issues. And many people historically are sort of accustomed to having a new president or the same president or, or at least an answer on election day, on election night. And so the question is, are we going to have that tomorrow? Well, the obvious answer is it's a, if, if, you know, if it's a landslide either way, one way or the other, then for sure we're gonna have an answer. But 
many people are saying that that may not be the case. So the first thing I want to share with you today is a actual screenshot from a great article over at 538.com. 538.com, you may remember sort of a, a project spearheaded by a guy named Nate Silver. Nate Silver made his, rec you know, his reputation back during the Obama administration, the Obama elections, when I think he called Obama's first election in 2008 for Obama. And I think he got every single state or every prediction exactly right. So this kind of, this guy kind of came up as being this wonderkin, somebody who can just kind of see through the numbers and just make it all clear. And uh, he, he built up a good reputation until 2016 when Donald Trump surprised the entire world. And a lot of the pollsters, a lot of people like Nate Silver, 538, were sort of going back to the drawing boards, trying to figure out what went wrong. How are their models so off? How did they not foresee that Donald Trump was going to win? So, you know, that's just a little context. You can take it for what you will. This guy, you know, has a, has a very important reputation. A lot of people will rely on him uh, and his site. And a lot of other people say, you know, um, maybe he's you know, part, more, more part of sort of the establishment, uh, you know, media and part of those sort of key decision makers that are part of that demographic. Now, that being said, this does come from 538. It, it really has nothing to do with much prediction, but it is sort of a breakdown and a, and a nice breakdown of the sort of the landscape, what it looks like across the country. So you can see here, this is what they are showing on election night. They're saying that uh, here is a, is a breakdown of all the different states and they're color coded. So you can see that there are some states that are darker than others. And what do they mean? Well, if it is a if it is a very dark green, it's anticipating that nearly all of the votes are going to be counted by election night. So you can see here Hawaii, Oklahoma, Arkansas, Tennessee, Missouri, Nebraska, Wyoming, Montana, Idaho, Oregon, Florida. Uh, we got Delaware, Vermont, New Hampshire, all of those, South Carolina, Alabama, those are all going to be probably mostly done and counted. And we should have final numbers by the end of the night. But the other states, yeah, they're kind of in the middle there. So the, these middle green colors are most but not all, which is you know the, the clear majority of the other states. And then only some are going to be collected from some pretty important states. In particular, we're talking about Pennsylvania. Okay, Pennsylvania is this one that has some squirrely rules that are flying around right now. And they've got you know, a lot, a lot of resources and a lot of effort are being poured into that state, both by the Trump campaign and the Biden campaign. And we may not even know what the rules are or what the what the final numbers are on election day. So I read an article today that said that seven of 67 counties or seven of, a, of 60 something counties in Pennsylvania sound like they're not even going to be making an effort to count the ballots on that election night. In other words, they're just they're going to wait until election day is over. So all day on Tuesday, they're just going to collect, collect, collect. Then on Wednesday, they'll start collecting or they'll start counting the ballots. And so those seven counties, people are trying to decide, well, what are, you know, what's the makeup of those things? Are they important? Do they matter? Are they going to come up with a serious, you know, are they going to impact the final results? And yeah, they could. There's 150,000 votes that are going to be making up those seven different counties. That's on a conservative basis. They're predicting that maybe it's, you know, it's more than that, given the context of this election. So, you know, you have potentially 150,000 votes that will not even be counted until the day after the, uh, the election person there, her name is uh, Bukvar. She has been trying to communicate with these different counties to say, you got to count your ballots faster. What are you guys doing? Count them, count them, count them. We need the, the answer. But if you remember back in 2016, Trump only won Pennsylvania by like 44,000 votes is a very small number. So if you have a large portion of the votes that uh, are, are not being counted until the following day, and if it's part of a pool of 150 or 100, you know, 200,000 plus votes that are being kept in a bin somewhere, we may not know, we may not know Pennsylvania tomorrow night at all. It may not be known until the next couple of days. Now we're going to talk more about Pennsylvania. I think a lot is going to hinge on this state, both electorally, but also in terms of litigation and in terms of how these, these legal issues are going to evolve and, and potentially, you know, move their way up the, the court system through the state Supreme court up to the, to the United States Supreme court. It could be very messy. So we're going to keep a close eye on Pennsylvania but I also wanted to share this other article that helps detail a little bit about how these timelines look. So this comes over from BuzzFeed. This is this article is a couple days old. It's posted on October 27th. It was written by uh, two two women, one named Addie Bayard and one named Zoe Tillman. They're over at BuzzFeed, and you know BuzzFeed. 
does does some pretty good reporting from time to time. I used to think of them as those clickbait articles, but now they've they've got these really nice graphics and they do a pretty decent job of of uh, you know sort of. Uh, collecting all of this data and synthesizing it for us. So this article is going through and it's detailing the vote by mail deadlines. And you can see over here, the description is that it says it's going to show you specifically what ballots are processed as they're received. So ballots are processed and they're tallied as they are received. So they're just coming in and they're being counted. And then we have a deadline that if they're received by this date with a black dot, then they are going to be counted if they're received by that date. On the other side, we have uh, ballots are tallied on election day. So ballots are coming in, but they're not counted. We have a, an open white dot, and then they're going to be actually counted if they're received by this date. So we just go through the list here, and you can see how this is all sort of breaking down. And we've covered some of these states in terms of the litigation that's pending as well. But you can see here that we have Alabama which is uh, you know on election day, counting on election day. Alaska, on the other hand, right? We got 13 days out, or, or this is going to be 10 days out. They're going to, they're not even going to. It doesn't even look like they're going to start. Yeah, they're going to start counting them, but they're still going to be accepting them all the way up until the 13th. And so I'm not going to go through this on every single state, of course. But Arizona is a pretty important one, as I said. They're coming in. We're counting them. We're done on election day. Nothing else is happening after that fact. And some of these other states are going to be the same way. So it looks like Florida is done. Uh, Georgia is done, but are we going to know their numbers? Well, if we go back over here, Florida, it looks like we're going to have a pretty good indication on Florida. We're going to know uh, specifically that all of the ballots are in counted, they're collected, and then it looks like we're going to get almost all of them answered. So according to 538 and BuzzFeed, Florida is going to be you know pretty close to call or pretty easy to call tomorrow night. Same with Georgia. So Georgia, by contrast, most but not all are going to be counted and all of their stuff is coming in. We're going to run into some problems. You know, they're saying Iowa is a battleground state right now. So, all, you know, they're collecting stuff coming in, but we're not going to know until six days later. Same with Illinois, but some of these are pretty, pretty much a foregone conclusion, right? Illinois is going to go to, uh, going to go to Joe Biden, not even going to be a question. Iowa is a battleground. Some of these others are pretty much, you know, cut and dry. Kansas will go red. Kentucky will go red. Louisiana will go red. Maine should probably go blue, right? Maryland will probably go blue. So they don't really matter. But Michigan, same thing here. That one should be known. Uh, should The ballot should be collected and done tomorrow night. But then we have, okay, so that was Michigan. So Michigan, we come back over here. Should know most all, if not all of that. Wisconsin's in the same boat. Pennsylvania is really the only one that is going to be really squirrely there. We go back over to Nevada. They're collecting ballots for another seven days. We've got North Carolina that has some pending litigation, which we're going to talk about. This has mostly been settled at this point. Same with Pennsylvania. Both of these are basically settled now. North Carolina was still pending. And so they were settled. So they were going to settle on, it looks like, on the sixth day, I think they're actually going out to the ninth now. So it was, they were going to compromise back down, but they're actually collecting ballots all the way up until the ninth. So we will get there. So this actually uh, extended a little bit. They're, they're doing six days after the election, which is going to put that at the ninth. So North Carolina is still going to be collecting ballots. Um, Ohio, same thing. They're doing, it looks like another 10 days. It was extended. Pennsylvania, this one is another three days. So it's going to go out to the six. That has also been settled because we have an opinion from Judge Gorsuch, who uh, who is uh, un unhappy with this. Right. So these basically any of these states that we are extending out that I think have additional extensions. Most of these lawsuits have been filed by the Democrats. I've covered that here at length. Republicans are filing lawsuits all over the place. Basically, this is a bloodbath from both parties when it comes to the courts. We'll wrap up some of the states here. You'll see Wisconsin. So they're not counting. They're not doing anything. Anything that comes in on Wisconsin. Wisconsin is going to be counted. It's all going to be collected and it's going to be, you know, all settled and done on tomorrow. And let's just check that one more time. So Wisconsin, it looks like most, but not all over there. So a little bit of, of corroboration between the two. And this is going to be interesting to see how this, how this unfolds because it's not that cut and dry. Now we do have some states, which we're going to talk about, which actually are now segregating different portions of this. So let's give you an example on what's what Pennsylvania is doing. So if we go over here to Pennsylvania, you're going to see here that basically um, all of the incoming ballots here. So they're going to start collecting them here and they're just going to hang on to them. And then they're going to start counting them at this time as well. So, so in Pennsylvania, so for example, there's a lot of ballots that should be coming in at this moment, but when they, or, or maybe not actually, they're all coming in starting tomorrow. 
the ones that are that are received after a, the close of election, they're going to be put into a different bin. So we have basically two two bins: the stuff that comes in on or before election day, and then the stump the the the, the ballots that are collected after election day and we're going to explain what that means but they're going into two different bins in other words normally these would all be into one bin but because some of this stuff is still pending with litigation we may have stuff that comes in after election day that the that the county election recorders and that the states are actually segregating and putting off into different groups because they know that they're going to be there's going to be litigation surrounding them right let's go back to our pennsylvania hypothetical what if we're in a situation where uh, let's say donald trump is up by a hundred thousand votes tomorrow night at the end of the day he's up by a hundred thousand votes okay well we have three more days of additional ballots that can come in and let's say they start coming in and coming in and coming in and we segment those ballots and now we have let's say two hundred thousand ballots that are in that second bin and many people are saying, well, half of those are Republicans, half of those are Democrats. Well, the Democrats certainly want to make sure that those get counted because that's their only chance of overcoming the deficit that Donald Trump has. By contrast, the Republicans are going to want to protect that. They're going to know that historically, just based on the numbers, that the Democrats are voting in larger quantities when they're voting by mail or voting absentee. So they're going to do everything they can to invalidate those votes. So both parties are going to be you know, clawing all over each other to make sure that, that they get the votes that they want. And the, 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 the devil's advocate argument on both sides is Republicans are saying, wait a minute, None of these should count because the courts were the ones who modified the election deadlines. The election deadlines were already set in law. It was by the hand of you know, unelected judges who've been appointed and who are not following the original rules. They're modifying these deadlines. They're all being done by fiat as a matter of the, strokes, uh, the, 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 the stroke of a judge's pen. It's not actually being done by the legislatures. These, these judges are just on their own changing the election rules after the fact. And so the argument from a lot of Republicans is you can't change the rules this late in the game. You got to throw this thing back to, to the way that it was. Pennsylvania law said you don't get a three day extension or, or, or North Carolina doesn't say you get a nine day extension. That's not written in the law anywhere. That is all done by judges as a result of trying to craft this this solution to a problem that the Republicans are saying doesn't exist. Now, the Democrats, by contrast, are saying, wait a minute, you know, coronavirus, COVID-19, it's ruining everything. Uh, we don't want to disenfranchise a lot of voters. There's a lot of people sitting at home who are too scared to go to the polls. They've never voted by mail before. We want to make sure that every single vote counts. And so we need to just suddenly, you know, extend these things so that these people have more time, so that they have time to mail their ballots in, to go talk to somebody, or a lot of their lawsuits want to actually lift up a lot of the original requirements that were already in place, things like getting a witness to actually, you know, sign off on an absentee ballot or, you know, signature matching requirements. There's a, you know, there's a requirement that your signature matches in some states and, and they want to get rid of those because they don't want people to get confused. They don't want people at home to forget to mail, you know, to sign their ballot because they've never done it before. Now it gets mailed in and those votes don't get counted. They say, well, that person, you know, they shouldn't have their vote not count just because they technically didn't follow the rules. We know technically they didn't follow the rules but we still want their vote to count, right? And so that's the, that's the opposing argument. So a lot of these judges are just kind of on their own crafting these new procedures in order to comply with what they feel are injustices in participation in democracy as a result of a lot of this coronavirus stuff. So good arguments on both sides. And a lot of this stuff is just working its way through the courts. And we're going to talk about what happened in Pennsylvania here towards the end of the show and sort of give you some, some, uh, some insight on how they're going to be breaking that down. But for our purposes here today, we're talking about you know, different bins of voting, is, uh, voting ballots in different states, the, the, the ballots that come before the close of election and the ones that come after those that come after whether they're not postmarked or maybe they are they are postmarked or, me, or maybe they came in and they just don't comply with the rules and you know now we have to have a decision on what we do with these votes we're going to talk about something that happened in texas today but this is what a lot of this stuff is being litigated over and remember both parties are doing this from both sides i've covered a lot from both from both teams here it's not one side doing it or the other and i see a lot of news stories from partisan websites 
pointing the fingers at other people. The Republicans are all pointing the fingers at the left. They're saying these guys are filing lawsuits uh, everywhere, which we've covered a lot on this channel. All of these different alliances for the retired people. There's you know multiple different states that have the alliance of retired people, which in my mind just look like you know these these big sort of. Uh, kind of like front groups for, for filing these lawsuits that were taking place all around different states in different counties in different parts of the country. So, you know, that's, that's one side of it, you know, and, and on the other side, the, the, the Democrats are saying that the Republicans are, are, you know, trying to steal votes away from them, from, from them and from their people. They're trying to disenfranchise a lot of these, uh, a lot of these individuals on a needless basis. So we'll just keep, you know, we'll just, the, the Democrats are doing it also. They're, you know, they're, we're going to cover a story that happened in Texas where they're claiming that the Republicans are trying to throw out a hundred thousand votes, which they, they are right. They are, everybody is fighting for votes. So we just need to keep that in mind. Both sides are doing it. And the lawyers who are involved in this litigation, they are having a field day for sure. All right. So let's take a look at the battleground states. We've covered this previously on the channel. Let's go through some of them. The Arizona we were giving over to Donald Trump. We think that w w it, there it was pending litigation in the state of Arizona, but it's looking like everything is going to stay the way that it was. So the Ninth Circuit granted an emergency stay. The lower court ruling is is uh, is going to be upheld, and Arizona is going to have its election on election night. Florida also we just saw that we're going to put that in the Donald Trump camp because we're going to have answers tomorrow night on election night. Georgia same deal should have. Uh, answers there. They were going to try to extend the ballot by three days, but that got stopped. And we're going to put that in the Donald Trump camp over to Michigan. That's also going over to Donald Trump. They were, they were trying to, to extend that. They wanted deadlines, extensions, and they wanted collection modifications. That's going over to Trump. These next three go over to Biden. Now, North Carolina was in the Trump camp, but I don't put it there anymore because last week on a four to three ruling, the Supreme Court didn't overrule the extension. Roberts joined the left in a, in a sort of a weird four to three ruling with we had uh, Amy. No. Yeah, we had Amy Coney Barrett and we had uh, Judge Kavanaugh both not not responding in those opinions. Uh, same with Pennsylvania. So between North Carolina and Pennsylvania, two four to three opinions out of the Supreme Court, even though we have nine judges now, we're missing two of them. So we got two four to three opinions out of these two states, out of North Carolina and out of Pennsylvania, those both go over to Biden. Minnesota is going to stay with Biden. They're they're collecting ballots up until November 10th, so a week after the election. And then Wisconsin, we're going to have an answer, hopefully mostly tomorrow. They're not going to be granting any other ballot deadline extensions. And so uh, that those are sort of the battleground states, but a lot of this stuff is happening elsewhere. So the battleground states are, of course, important for the electoral votes. But what about a lot of the local elections, you know, the local races? There's a lot of, uh, of, of additional non-presidential ballots that are very important. We're talking about the House. We're talking about the Senate. We're talking about, you know, when it comes to criminal justice issues, a lot of ballot propositions, things like, you know, legalizing marijuana or allowing the use of psilocybin uh, for medical purposes, or are we you know, going to be reforming cash bail? Or what about a lot of these local prosecutors? There's a couple prosecutors here. We kind of are interested in whether they get elected or not. I'm talking about on a national scale. They've been in, involved in national stories. We're going to tell you about them here in a minute. But this story is happening out of Texas. So we just learned today, this story comes from the Texas Tribune, that uh, nearly 127,000 Harris County drive through votes appear to be safe after the judge rejects the GOP-led Texas lawsuit. So here's what's going on here. The, the uh, Texas GOP, largely it sounds like a group of realtors, were filing lawsuits in order to get these ballots thrown out. So Texas set up uh, drive-through ballot tents and things in order for people to just drive through and drop their ballots off. And, you know, they made some other modification processes, uh, but, but by and large, they were collecting ballots in a way that was sort of a little bit out of alignment from Texas law, which says that you have to do things like, you know, vote in a building. And, you know, they're looking at the language of the law that says it's a building and somebody's looking at the law here and they say, well, this is a tent. That's not a building. You can't set up tents if you can't, if it's not, if the, if the law says it's a building. And so it's a, you know, it's a differing of interpretation of the law. And some people will say, well, no, a building, the tent's close enough, right? It's got a roof. It's got some walls. You can sit in there. It protects a shelter. It's gets close enough to a building. And so that's what everybody is arguing over these little sort of tweaks, these little nuances in the law. And here 
in, in largely my understanding is, you know, I'm not from Texas or, or I'm not super plugged in with Texas politics, but my understanding is that Harris County in Texas is a very, very democratic stronghold. And so if the Republicans were able to get in there and invalidate 127,000 ballots because of this technicality, because of, you know, there's, there's some nuance in the rules or because they set up some tents or they set up, you know, they did something a little bit differently. That could be a major win for the Republican Party. OK, and they have an argument for it. Right. If they're doing things that are not in conformance with the law. Then those are, are not part of the rules. Right. It's like if you're playing a game of Monopoly, you don't get to modify the rules halfway through the game. That's the argument that the Republicans are making. The judge, however, had a different opinion on it out of the uh, Texas Supreme Court. Well, here's what it said. So we have a Supreme Court of Texas. We have a ruling that says here you can see that the Supreme Court pronounced yesterday the following petition for a writ of mandamus is denied in Ray Stephen uh, Hotz. And we've got some other people here. The realtor's emergency motion for temporary relief is denied, and they, they submitted a big, a big motion, and this is all you see. So basically what happened here, just like we've covered with the Supreme Court, is there were submissions that were filed up to the Supreme Court in Texas asking them to do something about these ballots, 127,000 ballots that the Republicans are saying are in, illegal, and the Texas court just said, came back and said, no, we're not actually going to, uh, we're not going to actually listen to that. Uh, we're not going to hear that one right now. And here's why Chuck Lindell, who is a blue check mark over on Twitter, he said, the U.S. judge says he will not invalidate almost 127,000 votes that were cast in drive through lanes. He says, number one, the plaintiffs lack standing. All right, so what does that mean? Well, it means that the people who are suing here, they have nothing to say about it. They don't have any, you know, direct harm. They, they call it generalized injury here. So you need a specific harm if you're going to sue somebody. In other words, I can't go and sue Donald Trump and say, I'm mad at you for X, Y, and Z, whatever policy violation that would be. The court would say, okay, that's fine. You're mad at him. So is like 51% of the country most of the time. So uh, we're not going to do anything about that because you have no specific injury. You have to details something. What is the actual injury? Now, if Donald Trump passed a law that came and it resulted in me uh, having my house confiscated by the federal government, all right, well, now I have a specific injury. Now my house has been taken away and now I need to go do something about it. So in this case, they're saying that the people, the plaintiffs, the people who brought the lawsuit to begin with, they have no specific injury. It's just a general injury. Okay. okay so 127,000 people voted by, uh, by ballots in a drive through lane. What is, what's your problem with that? Well, it's uh, it's uh, you know a, a, a threat to justice. It's a threat to our democracy. Okay, how do you, how do you say so? How is it? How does it impact you specifically? Well, it's diluting my vote. It's doing whatever. Not good enough. You need more of a specific injury. So the judge denied that on that basis. Now that doesn't mean that another plaintiff, somebody else who does have standing, may not be more successful on the merits. It just means that this particular individual doesn't have any ability to bring that lawsuit. He says, even if there were standing, he would not issue the injunction against the votes. It's not timely. So he says, not only do you not have anything timely, but also uh, you didn't, uh, I'm sorry, not only do you not have standing, but you also have not filed this in time. Voting is not illegal. Car is not a polling place. If he was going to rule it, however, he said he would enjoin drive through drive through voting from taking place tomorrow because a tent is not a building as required by Texas law for a polling place. He says he wouldn't vote that way tomorrow if he hadn't already voted. Also, he orders Harris County to maintain records, computer cards of drive through votes in case the Fifth Circuit disagrees with him in the expected appeal. OK, so you can see here that, you know, a lot of people are saying, well, this is a huge win. The Democrats are, you know, are, are thrilled. We have, you know, justice and democracy and every vote's going to count. All right. Well, it's probably going to get appealed and it's probably going to go up to the Fifth Circuit. And then we're going to see what happens there. Now, it may not be of consequence because this is happening in Texas and Texas traditionally goes red. But if it doesn't, if it's close, you can certainly expect that this is going to be appealed and it's probably going to work its way up. Up, up, up to you know higher courts, uh, specifically outside of the state of Texas. So they're going to be maintaining records. They're going to be creating a separate bucket of you know these drive-through votes in case the Fifth Circuit disagrees. Then they're going to be able to go back and do something about all those votes. And this type of stuff is happening all across the country. Different states are you know are are, are trying to manage 
all of these last minute rule changes and it could open up a lot of exposure for a lot of litigation and a lot of you know contested problems all throughout the country tomorrow. So even though let's say Texas comes back red or it comes back blue and and it's by small margin of 50,000 votes, well, we know that there's 100, 120,000 votes that are sort of hanging in the balance. They're okay right now, but it's too late to do anything about it. They're going to collect them, but they're going to go into that separate bucket. And if we go up the, the, to, to a circuit court or we go up to the Supreme Court and they say, hey, guys, Texas law said it had to be voted in on a building, in at a building. You didn't do it in a building. That's what the rule says. I don't know what that rule is specifically, but you get my point, right? The deadline is this day and you modified the deadline and you did it in a way that was illegal in violation of the state constitution, in violation of the federal constitution. You can't, as a judge, as an unelected judge, can't just modify these things at the last minute. Sorry you did. Sorry that you, that you encouraged your constituents to do that, but you didn't do it appropriately. The, the original rule of law is what it is and they're going to you know modify it to, to, to skew things back towards what that original decision was or what the original you know position was it could go the other way it could go all the way the other way right a lot of these judges a lot of these courts could say okay the rules are a technicality we're not going to hold people to them you know as long as they sort of fulfilled the intent of voting as long as they did everything you know that they possibly could do to get it in on time and get it close you know as close to the rules as, as we can we're going to count it because we want democracy we want people to participate in in this you know in this election and so those are i think how these two things are going to to uh, delineate over the coming day tomorrow, and we're going to keep an eye on it. Some of the other things I want to follow tomorrow is, is going to be about marijuana. Okay, there are a lot of different uh, states now that are sort of uh, being more lenient on marijuana. The reason why this is such an important issue is because I have seen people go to prison for marijuana offenses. It's insane. I've seen people go to jail and go to prison. I've seen uh, really you know harsh crimes for something that in my mind shouldn't be the type of offense that we send people to prison for. It's ridiculous that we do, but fortunately in my time in practice, we've seen this sort of coming of, uh, of age where people are starting to realize that maybe marijuana is not the crime of the century. There are still some states that think it is, but most states are now coming around. So this is the state of uh, marijuana cannabis programs throughout the states that you can see here. So a lot of these states actually have basically totally you know, regulated adult use. So California, Nevada, Oregon, Colorado, some of these are the big ones that you know about. Alaska is on board. These in the middle green have a medical program. So Arizona has a medical program, Oklahoma, you know, all of these other states. We have some states, which I didn't even know was really a thing. We have CBD programs and low THC programs. So I'm guessing there's basically you know no active THC in any of these programs. And then we have just some states that have nothing going on. Kansas, Nebraska, South Dakota, Idaho uh, uh, are those states that have nothing going on. Well, starting tomorrow, we've got some ballot propositions that will be working their way forward. Here is what some of them look like. So Arizona, we have a marijuana legalization initiative. We're going to follow that one tomorrow. Mississippi has another one. They're going to be introducing medical marijuana. We've got two in Montana that are looking like marijuana uh, legalization. So they have uh, both looks like a constitutional amendment and an, and an initiative that the voters are going to be considering. Same situation out of South Dakota. We have a constitutional amendment and then we have a medical marijuana initiative. So one looks to me like it's going to be actually legalizing marijuana per a constitutional amendment, where the other one is just going to be introducing a medical marijuana program. So kind of two bites at the apple there. And I'm not real sure how those would work out. Like if one passes, what are they going to do with the other one and vice versa? New Jersey, also about legalizing marijuana. And so, you know, while we're all focused on the president and who that's going to be and the Senate and some of the more exciting races, uh, I'm certainly interested to see what is the national conversation on marijuana? Are, are more states going to be trending towards legalizing or at least decriminalizing the possession, the, you know, the, the manufacture of marijuana, because it is one of those things that I think is highly, highly antiquated. I'm not sure why it's still so illegal and so uh, uh, penalized, really. I understand the concern about it being a gateway drug. I understand all of that. I disagree with it. I think that alcohol is a lot more problematic than marijuana. But at the same time, um, I understand some of the reticence to have this unbridled, just, you know, free for all with marijuana and with cannabis. Um, that being said, 
I think we are trending in the right direction. We just want to see how some of these other states, especially some of these states who are a little late to the game. In Arizona in particular, I can tell you selfishly, I'm curious about how this is going to go because uh, a lot of a lot of people uh, you know, that, that we help, unfortunately, get charged with crimes for this stuff. And I do not want to see them have to go through the criminal justice system for something that is so uh, benign in my mind. You know, there are a lot of other things that I would like to see our local resources being used for rather than the enforcement of, in my mind, antiquated marijuana laws. The other thing that we're going to be keeping track of tomorrow, and we're going to get to the live chat here in a little bit, uh, and I want to know really from you, what, what do you want to follow? Of course, we're going to be following the presidency. We're doing a mega stream tomorrow, live stream, uh, for as long as I've got the energy and the stamina to do it, covering all of this stuff. One of the other things I wanted to cover tomorrow are prosecutors. So which prosecutors in which races, how are they going to be doing? One of the ones that I'm most interested in, well, actually, this one is, is um, yeah, I'm interested in this one, but I don't think this one is going to... Uh, I don't think this one is going to be that interesting. So this is Kim Gardner. Remember Kim Gardner? She was with the McCloskey case. So Kim Gardner, she's out of St. Louis, and she is on the ballot this year. So it's her, Kimberly Gardner. She won her primary as a Democrat. She's going up against Daniel Zrodowski, who's a Republican, and she is actually in St. Louis, and uh, she's going to be she's going to be running again. The Democrat the, the Democrats typically win this district, so I fully expect that she does win again. If you don't remember her, she's a prosecutor who made some kind of boneheaded statements when it came to the McCloskey case. McCloskey, you know, this situation was one that happened a while back. These two were on their, uh, on their basically the front porch of their mega mansion and some protesters broke in through a side gate when they were walking through the streets. These two who were both lawyers, I think at least one of them is a lawyer, they grabbed their firearms and they went out on the front porch. They came onto the scene uh, and, you know, McCloskey's here. They're saying that their lives were threatened. The protesters are saying their lives were threatened. So they were ultimately arrested and charged with crimes for, in my mind, just sitting on their front porch, protecting their property. I mean, I don't know what else, uh, what else was expected of them. They're being charged with crimes. They are defendants for standing on their property with firearms as people were breaking in, literally breaking the gate down on their, you know, on their, on their private, private gate. And so Kim Gardner is a prosecutor out of St. Louis who is charging them with crimes. Here is what she said at the beginning uh, of this whole case, which I thought was ridiculous. We are fortunate this situation did not escalate into deadly force. I will recommend the McCloskey's participate in diversion programs that are designed to reduce unnecessary involvement with the courts. I believe this would serve as a fair resolution to the matter is what she says. A diversion program, that's where you basically go and you plead guilty to a crime and what they'll do in many situations they'll actually hold on to that guilty plea so that they're actually they won't enter it on the record so if the mccloskey's wanted to do this if kim Gardner is, Gardner is being as generous as she says she's being all it would require is that the mccloskey's they just go into court they say yes your honor uh, we plead guilty to this offense uh, and we would ask that we allow be allowed to complete a diversion program. So what the court will do is they'll take that guilty plea and they'll just kind of hold on to it. They'll just set it back over here and they'll say, all right, look, we're going to hold on to that diversion plea deal. We'll say for about 90 days, maybe 120 days. We're going to let you go take some classes. OK, so McCloskey's, uh, even though you're multimillionaires, you know, successful lawyers, we don't think that you know how to handle yourselves appropriately. So you need to go take an anger management class, or you need to go take an alcohol class or a disorderly conduct class, or you need to go learn how to be a responsible adult one way or the other. If you do that, we're going to just take this guilty plea up and we're just going to tear it up and just throw it right in the garbage. If you don't do that, however, we're going to take this back and we're just going to enter it in on your record. And then we're going to sentence you according to this plea deal. So the McCloskey's, if you don't do your diversion, you're going to come back to court and I'm going to sentence you, I don't know, a day in jail, two days, 10 days, six months, whatever it is, whatever the judge wants to do and whatever is authorized by law, they could do that. So the McCloskey's would have to go and plead guilty so that the court could hang on to that and hold it over their heads. Do you think that they're going to do that? Would you do that if you were in their position? I certainly would not, nor would I advise them to do that were I their counsel. But Kim Gardner, the prosecutor extraordinaire from St. Louis, who has done a number of just ridiculous things, in my opinion, on this case is going to be up for re-election and we're going to see what happens in her case. Now, I do think she's probably going to get re-elected just as a matter of, of demographics, but we are going to add that one to our list because anything is possible and that wouldn't be a bad thing. All right. So that's Kim Gardner. The other one we want to follow is the prosecutor who was just caught in a ruckus over, I think this was, when was this? 
This was the Juicy Smollier case. Just I'm talking about Jesse Smollett. We're talking here about Kim Fox, who is the incumbent. She is running against Patrick W. Pat O'Brien, who's a Republican. We have Brian Dennehy, who's a Libertarian. And I'll never, for the life of me, I'll never understand why anybody in the Libertarian Party cannot just get a normal headshot for their campaign photos. I don't know why this is always the, the deal. It's always like this. These two people are sitting in front of the same thing, look probably at their debates. But the Libertarians just took this picture of this guy who looks like he got punched in the face over here at, at a, local, uh, a local restaurant. They just, you know, somebody snapped a photo and said, yeah, send that in to the news. That will be good. That is what, uh, oh, that, is, that is the Libertarian Party, unfortunately. I uh, would like to see a little bit more, a little bit more, I don't know, polish on what they do all right so kim fox she was running against pat o'brien over here now if you you may remember her so this was this was back during the jesse smollett stuff remember jesse smollett uh was alleging that he got jumped by a couple of trump supporters who put a noose around his neck and you know threatened to kill him and all this ridiculous stuff that happened at like two in the morning in Chicago when it was like a million degrees below zero, right? No, it didn't happen. Everybody knew that. And everybody had a suspicion about it for a long time. Well, when Jesse was responsible for, you know, basically calling, you know, hundreds of different police, everybody was investigating, where are these guys? These guys, you know, committed a hate crime. They were going to uh, lynch this guy. And so it was like this national uh, you know, sounding of the alarm. We had Kamala Harris. We had a number of people come out and support him and say, we believe him and justice for juicy and all that stuff for a long time. And it turned out to be a total hoax. Nothing, nothing was there. And Kim Fox, who is the prosecutor here, she just, that was her office. She was responsible for running this thing. Typically when you report a crime and you were lying about the crime, you get charged with a crime for that. It's called false reporting. There are a number of other things that you can do in there, and the person is assessed the penalty that's re, that's re, you know associated with all of the extra effort when you when you disband you know thousands of, of of different personnel to go and and investigate all this stuff. It's expensive. It's not free. So it was a hoax, and many people were saying, "Well, what happened to to Justice for Juicy? Where is Jesse Smollett? Why is he not being prosecuted for this? If anybody else would have done it." If you or I would have been sitting there and calling the police and making up a bunch of nonsense, we'd get in trouble for that. But for some reason, because of the political connections, because uh, Jesse Smollett was working with you know, Kamala Harris and her campaign, because he's sort of uh, plugged in as being an anti-Trumper, somebody who is trying to frame you know, these Trump supporters as you know, you know, tying a noose around his neck and all that stuff. It was too political. So people were saying... Is he getting a free pass because of that? You or I as a defendant wouldn't get charged with, would, would certainly get charged, but this guy wasn't. And then when it came back, when, when Kim Fox actually appointed a special investigator on the Jesse Smollett case, they found that there were some serious problems within her office. This story came out from the New York Times. You probably missed it, but it happened back on October 17th. It says that the special prosecutor, and this, this, Kim Fox is up for re-election right now says that when the special prosecutor was tasked with investigating this thing, they found that the attorney did not violate the law, but uh, it, didn't, it, it did abuse its discretion in deciding to drop charges and put out false or misleading public statements about why it did so. Wouldn't that just be disqualifying immediately? They didn't technically violate the law, but they did abuse their discretion, and they did put out false or misleading public statements about why they did so. These findings were published in Monday in, in uh, August. The special prosecutor's name was Dan Webb. He was appointed last year after the judge ruled that Kim Fox blew this case. They an announced that a new grand jury had received the case. They were indicting him on charges that he lied to the police in connection with the alleged hate crime. Okay, so Jussie, Jussie Smollett finally gets charged, but not because of Kim Fox. Kim Fox abused her discretion. Another part of Mr. Webb's investigation says that uh, involved in determining whether any person or office engaged in wrongdoing, they said that there was a substantial abuse of discretion and operational failures by the state's attorney office in prosecuting the initial case in 2019. So Kim Fox is the prosecutor in Jussie Smollett's case. Uh, her office by her own special prosecutor, Dan Webb, has said that she abused her discretion in deciding to drop the charges. She put out false or misleading statements, and it amounts to substantial abuses of discretion and operational failures. She's running for office. She's running for office against this guy, Pat uh, Patrick Pat O'Brien, who is a Republican. 
And this all-star down here, Brian Dennehy, who, you know, who, who we can't even get a legitimate campaign photo on. So, you know, that is going to be going on. So we got those two prosecutors. We've got Kim Gardner. We've got Kim Fox, Kimberly Fox. We've got, you know, other prosecutors around. The question will be, do you have any else that you think are worth following so we can add them to our list? And then the last thing I wanted to just touch on here were some of the ballot initiatives before we jump into the live chat. So California is going to be ruling on uh, California cash bail. You can see here uh, a yes vote is going to uphold the contested le uh, legislation, which would replace cash bail with risk assess assessments. So no more cash bail. They're going to do risk assessments for detained suspects awaiting trials. And, you know, this is something for a while. So as of 2020, California has utilized cash bail like a lot of other people have. You got to post cash in order to get out of custody. So when you're arrested, you're taken down in front of a judge and the judge will say, well, I think you're a flight risk. You're going to, you know, you're going to leave here. Like we talked about with Kyle Rittenhouse, uh, you know, he, he was charged with a crime in Wisconsin, went over to Illinois, goes back over to Wisconsin now because the extradition hearing was completed. The judge says, I'm still going to impose a $2 million bail on you or bond on you because I think you're going to leave again. The $2 million bucks is going to secure your appearance to return to court. And many people don't have $2 million bucks. Many people don't have 500 bucks. Many people don't have anything close to what it's going to take to get them out of custody. So the cash bail reform movement is now saying, let's not require people to post money in order to get out of custody. Let's just do an assessment on them. Let's see how much of a flight risk they actually are, and then we can decide whether or not to release them. And so it's a little bit more of a, I would say more of a defendant-focused uh, analysis. And what ends up happening, practically speaking, is the people who are in favor of cash bail, that just supports a lot of the, the, the people who can afford to get out of custody. The poor people are ultimately the ones who are most impacted in those scenarios. So California, we have SB 10 that is going to be on the ballot tomorrow. The other one, which is very interesting, which is sort of uh, one of these things that is, in my mind, indicative of everything that is wrong with California is here the California Uber and Lyft Proposition 22. So Proposition 22 would now make it formal that the drivers would be independent contractors for the purposes of Uber and Lyft. So yes means it's gonna define app-based transportation as independent contractors and it's going to adopt labor and wage policy specific to app-based drivers and companies. So what happened is California Assembly Bill 5 uh, was something that was originally passed that said that, that basically the Uber drivers and Lyft drivers need to be considered employees in order to work in the state which would require that Lyft and Uber and all of these rideshare companies actually hire them as employees, which means that they, they then have to you know, comply with all of the employment laws. So things like you know, uh, minimum wage and uh, you know, health care and all of that other stuff. The problem with that is that it becomes very, very expensive and it, you know, it changes the dynamic entirely. And so the response from Lyft and Uber had been to say, We're, well, we can't, we can't do business that way. And we're going to leave if you don't modify this. So uh, certainly this is going to be one of those that is very interesting. Uh, we'll, we'll see what California voters want to do with it. They've also got on the ballot an affirmative action bill, which is, uh, I haven't, he haven't heard that phrase in a long time. I thought this was sort of something that was more, uh, more from the 90s. But we have a yes vote supports this initiative to define app-based. No, no, wait a minute. No, we have, uh, that's the same one. All right, so we don't have the affirmative action clip on that. My apologies. The next one I want to go over to is Oregon. Oregon, this is, I think is going to be an interesting one. Oregon psilocybin. So we're seeing this, I had spoken previously about the medical marijuana, right? The country is sort of moving in that direction and we're starting to see some of this creep into some other drugs. And so this is what a lot of people who are opposed to a lot of the marijuana stuff are, this is their justification for being in opposition to it. They're saying as soon as we legalize marijuana, all this other stuff is going to come down the pike. They're talking specifically about bills like this. In Oregon, they're talking about psilocybin. So here we see a yes vote in Oregon on this bill, which is measure 109. It's entitled the psilocybin mushroom services program initiative. It says that a yes vote is going to support authorizing the OHA, the Oregon Health Authority, to create a program to permit licensed service providers to administer psilocybin producing mushrooms and fungi products to individuals 21 years of age or older. No, just opposes it and says that everything essentially stays the same. It defines the psilocybin products as um, any substance or mixture that contains a detectable amount 
of psilocybin. It would allow manufacturer, delivery, administration at supervised licensed facilities, and it imposes a two-year development period, which is new. I have not heard of this type of thing throughout the, the rest of the country. So Oregon's at the forefront of this. Uh, you know, I do think that there's probably a lot of, just, just from some of the some of the literature I've been reading and from some of the testimony from a lot of other people who are dealing with like things like trauma, right? From in the, in the suicide, grief, substance abuse, uh, addiction space. I'm reading that a lot of treatments are showing a lot of good promise and they're based in psilocybin and plant-based medicine. So I'm very curious as to see how this goes. I like the idea that, uh, you know, we're, we're not criminalizing people who want to help themselves, okay, rather than somebody who, let, let's take an example of somebody who, who thinks that they've got a lot of trauma and somebody in their life, a doctor, a medical professional is recognizing that this issue might be helped with this different type of treatment modality. Why don't we let somebody just go try that, right? If it's going to work for them or if it's going to be something that they can try, I am pro-freedom. I'd rather them try it and it not work than send somebody to prison for it for trying it. So we'll see what happens there in Oregon as well. Any other ballot initiatives that we want to talk about? Any other ballot initiatives? Let's let's hop on over to the chat and see how everybody is doing. Now, it's a slow news day. Um, it's actually a busy news day. It's a slow criminal justice news day. Everybody is just talking nonstop about the election. So let's see. Is there anything else anybody wants to talk about? Or does anybody have any questions about any of the stuff that we covered today? Let's take a look. All right, so I'm going to flip on the live stream. There we go. Okay, so Sarah Brown says the affirmative action vote is to repeal Prop 209. Prop 209 is a civil rights anti-discrimination law. This will repeal it. Okay. We have, that's from Sarah Brown. Thanks, Sarah. Yeah, for some reason I missed that slide. We have Watching You Daily, who says, at r, &R Law Group, I am in Washington State, and since recreational marijuana has been legalized, there has been a significant increase in DUIs, and primarily marijuana-related. Yeah, Watching You Daily. Very interesting question, and I think, you know, I think that is probably to be expected, right? If a lot more people are using a particular drug, the question is, are they using it safely, right? We don't want to incentivize or, or, or decriminalize something only for it to cause more crime. We don't want it to have that ripple effect that is going, you know, going to snowball down throughout society and cause wreckage. And the issue with marijuana in particular, this is an issue that we're dealing with in Arizona, is how do you test that? How do you test marijuana? With DUIs, we have what's called a per se limit. If you, Let's say you're, you, know, you have a glass of wine, you have two glasses of wine, and you're driving down the street and you test over the limit, whether it's a 0.08, I think it's a 0.08 in every state now. Some states are trying to uh, lower that down. It used to be a 0.10, but if you're at a 0.08 and you're above that limit, the state law says, you're under the influence of alcohol. We can just presume that you're drunk. There isn't anything like that for marijuana. So a regular marijuana user may be really high in terms of limits, but you don't really know how that, that impacts them in terms of impairment. With alcohol, we know because we've done so much testing that basically anybody who's over 0.08, they are some form of impaired. They can be, you know, uh, slurred speech or they could be falling over drunk depending on their tolerance levels. But everybody is impaired at above a 0.08. That's what our science literature has said, settled on, and that's what our state laws have settled on. But that same concept doesn't apply to marijuana. So somebody may be driving a car with some active THC in their body, but they're not impaired. Somebody else who doesn't smoke marijuana regularly may have the same amount of THC, that the active metabolite in their blood, and they may be just you know blind and not even able to see anything because they're so high. So it's very different. And the other, the other thing to think about with marijuana and DUIs and other crimes is how do you test for it? Okay, with a DUI, you can blow into a breath test. You can blow into a machine like that. They don't have anything like that that's an analog for marijuana. So if it does pass in these several states, it will be interesting to see how they are enforcing that. Okay, so we have uh, Gigi's back in the house. He says, hey, Rob and Faith, how are you both doing? So Gigi, I'm pretty, I'm pretty happy that... The, uh, the election is tomorrow. I'm going to be looking forward to getting back to talking about a lot of the other stuff that we like to talk about here. Um, you know, the election stuff is interesting. Uh, 
but it'll be good to move on to different topics. I'm doing well. Faith is also in the house. Faith is, uh, she's doing good, but I don't think she's uh, chatting right now. So thanks, Gigi. How are you, my friend? We have Zulu who says, Rob, I think the time change jacked up the attendance. It started an hour earlier in Illinois. Yeah, so Zulu, good good, good point on that. We, we actually are sticking by Arizona time right now. So we haven't m modified our time at all. So uh, it's basically going to be 3 p.m. California, 4 p.m. Arizona, uh, 7 p.m. Uh, no, 6 p.m. Central, 7 p.m. Eastern, I think is how the time slots are going to work out. And we just have to do that just for our scheduling purpose. So the show may change and it may take a while for people to, to come back on board with that. But uh, we're, you know, we'll, we'll be here. And if they, if they miss the start of the show, they can always catch the replay. So we have... Uh, thank you for that, Zulu. Yeah, I, I notice the attendance is pretty low. It's also, it's also, you know, kind of a kind of a slow day. You know, the election priest, I think everybody's kind of electioned out a little bit. So Momo Paintball says, why is the Electoral College important to you? So that the, the main reason for me is that I think it's more representative of the country at large. I personally do not want our elections to be decided by California, New York, and Florida, and Texas. I think there's a lot of other uh, parts of the country that have a lot of other issues that are important. And I think if you just got rid of the Electoral College and you made it just a popular vote, mm -hmm. those main population hubs would then dictate the policy for the country. And quite frankly, if you look a lot of, at a lot of those population hubs, they're not real well governed. And I don't want my, my locale, my city, my state to look like Los Angeles. I just don't. That's why I want the Electoral College to stick around. All right. We want to say never trust a lawyer says I want to say Faith is doing a fabulous job moderating. And I think she has earned a pay raise. Not only that, the holidays are just around the corner. So I'll make sure she gets that message. Let's see here. Watching you daily, I think was responding to the DUI question. He says the way they are enforcing it in Washington state is in a complete is in a, an implied consent state, which allows actual blood or urinalysis of a DRE officer suspects someone of being under the influence. OK, so so watching you daily, that's, you, you sound like a lawyer, you sound like a defense lawyer, because that's a lot of the technical stuff that we, we talk about in DUI cases, right? Implied consent, many people don't understand what this means, but implied consent means that if you get a license, you're basically consenting to the government that you're going to give them a sample of your blood or breath if they ask for it, so, right? So many people think, well, no, they need a warrant for this. They need all of this stuff to get it. And technically that's all true, but there's, there's two sort of parallel areas of law that run together. And this is technical in the weed stuff, but you have criminal court, which deals with the criminal charge. And then you have your MVD, your DMV, your motor vehicle department, which is going to be governing the licensing part of your driver's license. And remember driving is a privilege. It's not a right. So in order for you to gain that privilege from the government, you need to, to agree as part of a contract that once you're driving on their roads, you're going to consent to give them a sample. It's implied consent. If you do not give them consent, then they just go get a warrant. They're going to draw your blood anyways. And then they're going to say that you violated your implied consent contract and they're going to suspend your license. So that's what watching you daily is talking about there. So he's saying it's implied consent. If you get pulled over, they call a DRE, which is a drug recognition expert who comes onto the side of the road, you know, looks at your eyes, looks in your mouth, says that you have, you know, an eye twitch or, you know, they make up a bunch of stuff in my mind. And then they'll say you're under the influence of drugs. Then they'll arrest you. Then they'll take you in for a blood analysis. Now, again, the difference between a marijuana blood analysis and a DUI blood analysis, it's a complex difference, but one is, it's basically the way that the tests are set up. One, the alcohol tests are, at least in Arizona, are set up to just kind of crank them out. They, they load a bunch of tubes, 92 different tubes on these different trays. They put them in there and they crank them out. They're just testing for alcohol. The machines are all calibrated for alcohol. They're called gas chromatography machines and they're all just finely tuned to test alcohol. When you're testing drugs like marijuana, you have to test for a whole different variety of drugs, right? There's tons of different drugs. There's different strains. Things can be laced differently. And so it requires a lot more testing and typically a lot longer testing uh, delay time. So alcohol can be tested in a month. Drug tests, depending on how back the, you know, backed up the crime labs are, can take months and months and months, sometimes six months, seven months. In Arizona, at one point in time, we had a backlog of like nine months. It was crazy. And so that's what complicates things a little bit more. So if you're going to be doing a lot of marijuana testing uh, or, or, or DUIs, you're going to have to ramp up your testing. And it's going to be interesting to see uh, how the states respond 
Watching you daily says I have a degree in criminal justice and took extra legal classes to understand how Washington state applies. I'm looking to get into law school fall of 2021. Yeah. Watching you daily. It sounds like you're on the right track. It sounds like, you know, how a lot of this stuff works. So good for you. I'm excited for you. That'll be fun. USA libertarian says government is sure doing a great job keeping the roads safe. It's only like the biggest cause of death. Kevin Coburn says, did you hear about Michigan courts overturning the secretary of state's last minute rule that banned open carry at the polls? I did not hear about that. So that's the other thing I wanted to cover tomorrow. I wanted to see if we could keep maybe a log of some of the, um, some of the shenanigans going around. So as a reminder, Hey, by the way, if you're not, if you're not, if you haven't already seen it, so I put the link down to the discord in the description on our YouTube channel, and we're going to try to get this, the, the discord situated a little bit. Uh, I'm going to be working on that tonight and tomorrow. I've never used discord. I just started it. And so I have all these different channels created and I don't know how to do the permissions and all of that stuff. So if you, if you, if you go there and it looks like it's a mess, it's because it kind of is. And we're going to try to sort that out. Faith, faith is going to help me get it situated. And basically what we were trying to think about doing for tomorrow is as we're doing this live stream, I've got a you know, number of the different sources that I check, but if people are finding different, you know, election shenanigans, we want to keep a log of that. And we have this piece of software that we use called monday.com, which I am going to, uh, to detail tomorrow, but we want to get all this stuff organized and we want to start, you know, basically keeping track of this. Are there different, are there, you know, are, is there suppression efforts going on? Is there voter intimidation efforts going on? Uh, are there last minute lawsuits being filed? Are there, you know, blockades? Are they closing things early? Are there strikes? Are there protests that are, you know, preventing people from getting into polling places? All of that type of stuff. We want to just sort of catalog some of it. So we'll see, we'll see uh, how that unfolds tomorrow. But we will certainly be here. All right. Some other questions. Do you have any thoughts on how COVID will be politicized once the election is over? Yeah, I think that if Trump wins the election, it's going to be another year of COVID. If Joe Biden wins the election, COVID is going to be gone by January. Uh, just, just, uh, uh, just a guess. Gigi, he says, which is important because Harris County is gigantic. USA Libertarian says, yeah, if Biden wins, COVID will go away miraculously quickly. Texas goes blue tomorrow. That comes from our house. He says, CB says free Kyle. Pablo Lasha says, instead of testing for alcohol or drugs, they could focus on dangerous driving and then use their experience and training to remove any driver who is in danger instead of incentivizing ticket revenue. Yeah. The joke in criminal law is that the cops are they're they're not really out there to serve and protect as much as they are out there to tax collect. Do you like that little cadence there? No, I don't believe that 100%, but they do do a lot of taxing. Okay, we have... We should use Discord to play whodunit games. Somebody says free Kyle. We have... I think Trump was right when he said COVID, COVID, COVID. That's all we're here until November 4th. Fourth, Black's Law Dictionary from Brian Reinhardt says... A license permit is government permission to allow something that is otherwise illegal. So marriage is illegal unless licensed by the government. So I am not a family law lawyer, so I do not want to step in that one, but it's a good question. We have Gigi who says, uh, R&R, funny enough, I am from Harris County. Harris County is kind of blue, not very blue by any means. If Republicans manage to get rid of 120,000 votes, they could turn the county red, which I, which I think they will think they're going to attempt to do that. Okay, great show as always. Just FYI, you guys started earlier at 6 p.m. Eastern time. So I, I haven't decided on the time yet. I just haven't decided on what we want to do. Do we want to just fix this show to Eastern Standard Time and also move? Here's the thing. Arizona, we don't shift. I don't know why everybody shifts. We don't shift. So we're kind of stuck in this quirky little thing. So maybe we'll move this. Maybe we'll just we'll, we'll, we'll join Eastern, the Eastern Standard Time and move this from 4 p.m. to 5 p.m. We'll think about that maybe moving forward to tomorrow. Okay. All right. Never trust a lawyer says, I think you should, I think you would be doing the public a service if you did a segment on how to act when getting pulled over or any interaction with the police. Yeah, I could do that. That's no problem. Yeah, we do that all the time. I give a talk in public when it's non COVID and, uh, and I have a whole segment on that. I'd be happy to do that. Zorro says if Floyd had died anywhere else, he'd have been listed as a COVID death. The Nito God says chances of us getting a clear election winner before we wake up the next day. So we kind of spent the whole first part of the show talking about that Nito. And it's, it really depends, you know, if this thing is a landslide, then we'll know. But if it's not, you know, Pennsylvania, they're going to be collecting and counting ballots for three more days. North Carolina, which is another battleground state, 
up to nine days. And there are other states that also have extensions. A lot of the main states like Wisconsin, I think is a big one right now. Um, Arizona is another battleground state. You know, those are going to be decided tomorrow night. Now we may not have the final tally, but they're good. They, you know, ballots are not coming in after the fact. So literally in Pennsylvania tomorrow, is not the end of the election. It actually takes place three days later. So if tomorrow, if you know, if a lot of these different networks are calling it one way or the other, that could change. And people think that this doesn't happen, but back during our special election in Arizona, I think this was 2018, when Martha McSally was running against Kristen Cinema, Kirsten Cinema, here locally, two senators, Martha McSally was winning on election night, but the absentee ballots that came in after the fact put Martha McSally over the top. And now we have Martha McSally as a senator from Arizona. So it does happen. It can and it does. Okay. Let's... USA Libertarian says you'd get a million views if you do it right. Yeah, I can certainly do that. I have a good idea for it. I've got some. I've got. Uh, I've got a little bit of different ideas on how to handle those. I think than some other lawyers. So I can definitely put that together. All right. Why did two Supreme Court judges not vote? That comes from Michelle and Bergia. So uh, Kavanaugh, I don't know why. Uh, Kavanaugh, I, I don't have an answer on that one. But Amy Coney Barrett, she said she said that she didn't participate in the votes, uh, at least according to her office, because she had not read the briefs. She had not been fully briefed on the issues. And so she there was a motion filed in the Pennsylvania case that was asking her to uh, recuse herself. And that became moot because she 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 didn't recuse herself, but she did just not participate in it. She said, I didn't file. I didn't have enough time to read the brief, so I'm not going to rule on them on these issues. Now, Kavanaugh, I don't know why, what, what that was about. I haven't seen anything about it either. Yeah, Zulu says Kavanaugh was taking a nap. Uh, Michelle comes through with a big super chat. Thank you, Michelle. Michelle Imburgia says, thank you for giving your time. You are great at explaining stuff. Thanks, Michelle. I appreciate that. Uh, you know, I have a lot of fun with you guys, so I, I really appreciate it. This is, uh, it's exciting. I actually, I look forward to coming on and, and having these conversations. It's a lot of fun. Faith loves it too, so we appreciate you. We appreciate you all. All right, Martine says, as someone who got booked because knowing wrong people in Norway where things are probably less bad than most U.S. states, don't say anything without a lawyer present. It's very good advice. And Watching You Daily says, they also have instant drug test kits for UAs that can provide an initial result to establish probable cause for the arrest, and then the rest of the urine is sent to the drug lab. All right. Um, yeah, so so yeah, Watching You Daily, you're, you're exactly right. So you're, you're sort of talking about uh, two different things, right? You're talking about a uh, qualitative test and a quantitative test. So qualitative will tell you what's in it, what you know, what is it, what's the quality of what you're looking at. Then you're going to want to go over and do a quantitative test to say, okay, how much is in that thing? So you know, what is it? Then how much of it is it? So how much? You know, it, what is it? Is it marijuana? Is it cocaine? Is it methamphetamine? If we know what it is, then how much? of it is in that person. So it's those two different tests. One can be used to establish probable cause to say, okay, we know that there's, there's a positive amount of this in there, but the other is to say, okay, now we're, we know that we're over a legal limit. So it is, um, it's a good question. So yeah, Elias Diaz says, are you starting your streams earlier now? Missed out, we'll watch the VOD later. So I think it's looking like we're just gonna move this. Um, Okay, so Gigi says he'd love to help us set up the Discord. So Gigi, send me an email, will you? Send it over to Robert at rrlawaz.com um, if, you, if you have not got it. Yeah, Discord link in the description at the bottom. Uh, if, you'd like, if you'd like to help with any of this stuff, just send me an email. It's robert at rrlawaz.com and we will, uh, we'll, we'll get you plugged in because we're going to try to build a little bit of a community over there. We have USA Libertarian who's got a shout out for Faith. This is for Faith. Buy yourself half of a Starbucks with a $5 spot. Uh, yeah, those the Starbucks is pretty expensive over there. All right. Uh, Mana says Discord links are at the bottom. Yes. We have Valhalla who says Amy already seems to be fulfilling her promise as a bipartisan. If she were partisan, she would have voted against Justice Roberts and the other justices. Yeah, so Valhalla, this is a good point. Yeah, this is one of those things where, to me, remember we talk about this a lot on this channel, that, that the only real power that the Supreme Court has stems from its legitimacy. Okay, the Supreme Court is not like a lot of the other the other two branches of government. The executive branch has a lot of power. They can, you know, they exe execute the laws. That's why we call them the executives. They've got the FBI, they've got the Justice Department, they've got a lot of enforcement tools in their arsenal to go and enforce the law. So if, if somebody says we're not going to do it, they say, oh yeah, 
Well, the FBI says you are. Either do it or we're going to come prosecute you. You're going to go through the Department of Justice. There's going to be a U.S. attorney who will prosecute you and put you into prison if you don't do it. That's what the executive has. Congress, we call, you know, we say they have the power of the purse strings. So they have a lot of, of, of mechanisms to just take the money away. Either you do it or we just don't pass. We just don't include you in the budget anymore. OK, so if you, you know, if the if, if you EPA, if you're not, you know, following these new rules, we're just not going to fund the EPA. The House of Representatives sets the budgets. They, you know, they propose the budgets that go over to the Senate and then they go over to the president. So they have the power of the purse. But the judiciary doesn't have any of those tools. They have only the legitimacy of the court. And so if they if they surrender the, the legitimacy or if they become illegitimate, then they almost have no power. And this is this was my big concern about packing the courts. OK, what happens right now if you just say, yeah, we don't like how the court is structured. So we're just going to add five liberal justices to the court. What is that going to do the next time you have a Republican Congress or a Republican uh, president? They're just going to say the court's too political. They can they can rule that my bill is unconstitutional or that my executive action is unconstitutional. I don't care. What are they going to do about it? They're not going to enforce anything. And so that is where this really comes, you know, comes into a, a problem. So what we've been seeing thus far out of the Supreme Court is that a lot of the, the different decisions are being left over to the states. So remember when I talked about, actually, I have a slide on this. So remember when I talked about um, the, 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 the different judges ruling different ways. And when we we're talking about Roberts, he actually joined with the liberals. So here is this slide. So you see here, we'll leave the live chat up, but here we have Roberts who joined over with Breyer, Sotomayor and Kagan on a lot of these cases. Amy Coney Barrett and Judge Kavanaugh both did not participate in this last uh, decision. And we have Alito, Gorsuch, and Thomas who are over here with Pennsylvania. Now, Roberts joined over here, and by joining over here and not joining over here uh, on the right, it's going to maintain the status quo. So when, when the judges are, are split and reject something, then the, the lower court ruling stands. So what Roberts has been doing is just letting the lower court rulings stand. Now, that may change. If this stuff comes up to the Supreme Court and it's a new, you know, after the election, we have new lawsuits. We're going to see, is, is Judge Roberts going to still side over there? Probably not, right? Because now we're going to be setting new precedent. We're going to be setting formal Supreme Court case law that's going to trickle down throughout the rest of society. Here, what Judge Roberts was doing was just saying, look, I'm not going to get in that. This is a state level fight. You guys figure it out on your own. I'm not getting involved. But once you know, once you can't do that anymore, once we have we need the court to decide how this next election is going to go, if that is the situation, Roberts can't just say, I'm, I'm, I'm out of it anymore. And same with Amy Coney Barrett, same with Judge Kavanaugh. They're not going to be able to sit this one out right now. They're, they're just refusing to play the game a little bit, probably in large part because it's too politicized. It's too it's too contentious. They don't want to they don't want to jeopardize the, the legitimacy of the court at this stage. They'll save that for a later time. It's a very good question. We have Zulu. Okay, yeah, so USA Libertarians throwing five over to Faith. Zulu's throwing five over to Faith for more Starbucks. And uh, Pablo Lasha says Roberts has become a real disappointment. Okay, we have, yeah, Watching You Daily says, I can tell you there will be lawsuits from Washington State. Martine says, would not... Would not making term limits better make the nomination process less political? Here we we recently got an evaluation where Poland and USA was a reasons to secure Supreme Court, you know, non-political. So, so uh, Martin, if you're talking about Supreme Court term limits, I don't think that you can do that without a constitutional amendment. They say lifetime appointment, and it says to the to the Supreme Court. I don't think that there's a lot of constitutional argument in, under United States law that you can go and impose a term limit on the Supreme Court judges or that you can remove them from that high bench. I don't think you can do that without a constitutional amendment. I know there's a lot of arguments to the contrary on that, but I don't think that the nine judges are going to water down their own roles on the court. So if, you, if, you, if the Congress tried to pass a law to say, we're going to just take the judges off the court, I don't think the judges are going to find that constitutional. I just don't. So I, without a constitutional amendment, which is a hugely, hugely high hurdle, right? You need two-thirds of both houses, and you need three-fourths of all states to agree to the amendment. I don't think it's going to happen. So I think it's going to stay the same unless the Democrats pack the court, which is a lot lower standard. All they just need is an act of Congress in order to do that.
Okay, so at Gigi says, I think you should also post the Discord link in the community chat so more people get the notification and join. So we can certainly do that. So let's do that right now. So I just sent over that chat. So click that button and head on over to the Discord. Uh, Dylan Schumann says off topic, but where did you get your wall decor? What is it? Sound absorption pads. No. So these are like, um, plastic things. Uh, Miss Faith found those. So I will have to, um, I'll have to ask her where she got those and maybe she'll post those over on the discord or she'll post those in the community tab. And yeah, I will also drop that link in the community tab. USA Libertarian says Republican SCOTUS are always shaky. Liberals always 100% predictable. Yeah, USA Libertarian, I said that as well. I said, uh, you know, I was very impressed with Amy Coney Barrett. I liked her confirmation hearings. I like her record. She's solid. I think she's, you know, 100% like uh, blemish free, in other words. I mean, just, just amazingly on point on everything. And I'm ready to be super disappointed by her. Yeah, Gigi says community tab is what I meant. We'll definitely do that. We'll throw it over there. Michelle Imbrugia says, I heard that Flynn's lawyer, Sidney Powell, is being considered for director of the, of the FBI. So I saw that on a, on a tweet. I didn't know if that was, I didn't know if that was um, a joke or not. Issy says, hey, can we have a brief recap? I'm new here. Hey, Issy. Yeah, thanks for being here. So um, I'm grateful that you're here. Yeah, what we do on this channel is it's called Watching the Watchers Live. And it's a program that we ordinarily, what we're talking about is monitoring misconduct for police, prosecutors, judges, and politicians. I'm a criminal defense attorney. I've got a team of attorneys here uh, here at our law firm, the r, &R Law Group. You can't see our sign back there behind the chat. But we've helped literally thousands of people. I'm a criminal defense attorney myself. We've got, I think, six other criminal attorneys here at our firm. And so we've helped a lot of people through the justice system and we see a lot of misconduct all across the board. And so what we want to do here is just really hold them accountable, you know, shine some transparency, shine some sunlight down on these different entities of our justice system so that we can have good conversations about what needs to be done. How can we help modify things? How can we help, you know, reform people who are criminals so that we can integrate them back into society so that so, you know, society is better off. They're better off. Justice is done. And we have a good, you know, functional human, not a broken, beaten, uh, just destroyed individual who's been grinded and just ground down through the justice system. We don't want that anymore. So we, we, we hold people accountable here and we just talk about a lot of these criminal justice issues. Lately, it's been election, a lot of election, 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 which is why I'm so grateful that we're almost done with it. Hopefully, fingers crossed. We'll see. Uh, thanks for being here. So we have we have uh, Zorro says you can have a Starbucks on me. So we're just going to go get just we're going to get lattes. It's going to be election latte. We're going to be caffeined up. Um, Faith is probably going to pumpkin spice it up, you know, just pumpkin latte, pumpkin everywhere, lather, just pumpkin all over the place. So it'll be fun. Thank you for the super chats to help support that uh, cause. USA Libertarian says we don't deserve another Scalia. Kyle, Kyle is probably Kyle Rittenhouse. Uh, Kyle Rittenhouse is a case that we've been following. So on this channel, we typically will follow cases sort of sort of like we would follow a case load, right? So uh, you know, a, a practicing criminal defense attorney has a number of cases that they follow, right? P cases that they're working on. We're kind of replicating some of that here. We're following along important cases that I think are relevant to justice. And uh, specifically, we've covered Kyle Rittenhouse. We've covered uh, Breonna Taylor. We covered Jacob Blake. Of course, we covered George Floyd. We covered Ahmaud Arbery. We covered Rayshard Brooks. Uh, we've covered Matthew Doloff, a lot of them. And we just kind of follow those along, spent some time on Galen Maxwell. And, and you know, there's, there's, there's no shortage of criminal justice issues to talk about. So uh, that's why we're happy that you're here. Uh, USA Libertarian says, with a super chat, thank you, USA Libertarian. He says, can we find a lawyer to solicit Kyle Rittenhouse to charge his legal team with malpractice? Oh, I have so many issues with his attorneys. And I, I, uh, I, I talked about this at length on Friday, and I'm actually going to clip that up and, and segment that out probably with, a, with an addendum or a, uh, an addition to it because Kyle Rittenhouse got transferred over to Wisconsin today. He had uh, his day in court for the bond hearing and the bond was, was not changed. It's still holding steady at $2 million. And as far as I can tell, this whole thing happened largely without uh, any knowledge from Kyle's team. It went over to his new attorney who happens to be a criminal defense attorney in Wisconsin, but John Pierce and Lynn Wood, 
late on Friday, after we heard that Kyle was actually going to be uh, extradited, actually be transported, uh, they were talking about appealing the extradition hearing ruling. So I don't really know what they're doing. I'm not real sure that they know what they're doing either. But, uh, you know, we'll see. It's ultimately going to be up to Kyle. And, you know, I'm not sure how anybody gets through to him. And I'm not sure, you know, if, if, uh, if there's going to be any progress on that. We'll see. Watching you daily about the diversion programs you were discussing can cause you... Uh, yeah. So diversion programs can cause you to forego your right to own a firearm. There are certain States that will, will definitely, uh, revoke that right. If you plead guilty to a diversion eligible offense, if it's a domestic violence offense is is typically the distinguishing factor there. If it's a DV offense, they'll typically want to pull your right to possess a firearm. Pablo Lasha says, haven't Kyle's lawyers already blown through a million without any progress? I don't really know. Yeah, I don't really know. I think that's part of the problem is that nobody really knows where the money is going. All is vanity says, will they post bail? So bail's at 2 million. Don't think they have 2 million yet. The email I got from Kyle said they only need 600 more. They already got 1.4 million. So that's good at least. Yeah. Yeah. You know, this was something where I was saying Kyle should have been, they, sh they should have moved him back over to begin with. You know, they could have just moved him back over to begin with. I don't know why they let him sit in custody for two months over there fighting extradition. They could have moved him over. They could have raised the funds. They could have filed a, a solid motion to modify the bond. I don't know if they did any of that. So he just sat over there in Illinois for several months, I think unnecessarily. Kind of ridiculous. Yeah, the Zulu says the Kyle Rittenhouse thing has turned into a money grab. Save your pennies. Yeah, yeah, it's it's... Uh, the Nito God says, does, does having a high profile case make a defense easier or harder? Really depends on the case. We've worked on a couple of them. Um, it, it really, a lot of it depends on the client, actually. A lot of it depends on the client. So some of the, some of the more high profile cases uh, lead to, I would say, mismatched expectations. You know, people think that because it's high profile, that suddenly that they're going to be exonerated because the public is interested in, in the case or because... Uh, it's going to give them some sort of leverage. You know, we get a lot of, we get a lot of people who call and they'll say, uh, you know, my case is the crime of the century. You know, as a lawyer, if you represent me, I'm going to sell you my book rights or I'm going to sell you my movie rights. And then you'll make a million dollars or two, you know, $10 million off the story because I know I'm going to be exonerated because my case was in the newspaper. So people will have those, those sort of mismatched expectations. And that typically doesn't work out. You know, it's, th this is not like Hollywood criminal defense law is mostly just routine stuff. It sounds very exciting and it sounds super interesting, but 98% of the time, it's just pretty routine. And that's kind of how you want it to be. You want it to be consistent. You want it to be focused. You, you, you don't want a lot of surprises. You just want things to stay on track, right? You want the train to stay on the tracks. And when it starts to get exciting and it starts to get crazy, that, that, that may not be a good sign, which is one of my criticisms of uh, of John, John Pierce, you know, when he was in court on Friday and he was saying, uh, you know, game, set, match, your honor. And he was holding up this one document saying that uh, this document was going to be the, the, uh, the nail in the coffin against the extradition. And it's like, that's not how this works. This isn't Hollywood. You know, this isn't a movie. This is pretty routine stuff. It's pretty basic. You just got to do, you know, you got to be really, really solid on the fundamentals, fundamentals. And I don't think that his attorneys have indicated that at, at all. So USA Libertarian says, I'd love to do it. Tell them to sue me. I'm not a lawyer. I'd love them to sue me. Yeah. Pablo Lasha says game, set, match. Yeah. It's just kind of, kind of silly. What happened to the sixth amendment? We have Fermenti Mountain says Kyle will have no problem in the pin. Well, hopefully he doesn't stay there. All right, everybody. Well, listen, it's looking like the chat's dying down a little bit, which means it's my cue. And I want to thank everybody for being here. So as a quick reminder, so I'm going to throw the discord in one more time. Head on over there. I'm going to hop on there like literally right now and try to figure it out. So if you're if you're over there, I'm going to end the live stream. I'm going to bounce on over to the discord and then I'm going to try to sort it out uh, to try to try to figure that out. I want to be back there tomorrow. Um, one more thing. Let me see if I can show you this while I am thinking about it. So this is how we're going to start structuring some of our uh, our, our analysis tomorrow on uh, so this is, this is a, this is a software called, uh, monday.com and well, let me switch it over here. 
All right, so let me swap this. So this is called Monday.com, and we've got these different battleground states, and we've got these different bills that we're going to be following. And I'm going to basically spend you know, most of the day and tomorrow populating this. And what we want to see is, you know, here in Arizona, if you have a, you know, like election shenanigans, we can just add them here so we can say, uh, you know, voter suppression and then link to Twitter.com, whatever. Uh, right. So we'll, 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 we'll throw it in the link and then we'll be able to keep running tabs and we'll be able to sort of monitor this. You know, is it going to the left? Is it going to the right? We've got different dates. Uh, if you're interested in being a part of this sort of conversation, um, hop on over to the Discord and then we'll see about adding you to this board so that we can have, you know, running updates sort of as, 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 as a community, we can, be, we can be talking about some of this stuff. So that's kind of my, my vision for, for tomorrow. Totally open to suggestions. I'm going to post the, the actual uh, Discord stuff in the um yeah the discord link is permanent so head on over there i'm gonna leave that i'm gonna leave that permanent and then we're gonna we're gonna just throw all the discord uh we're gonna throw the monday stuff in the discord all right so uh thank you so much everybody for being here we're gonna be here all day tomorrow it's gonna be a long long live stream and it's gonna be a lot of fun and i'm excited to have you be a part of it so if you're not already subscribed hit that subscribe button uh, if you are awesome, we'll see you tomorrow. So tomorrow we're going to do, we're going to go live at the same time. It's going to be 7 PM Eastern time. So that's going to be 5 PM Arizona time. Okay. 7 PM Eastern, 5 PM Arizona. We were, we went to live today at 4 PM, but that's because daylight savings time changed. So we're going to move it to five. I will see you tomorrow. And USA Libertarian said Discord, yeah, is the Discord link permanent? Yes. I will screenshot Monday. I will throw it in Discord and I will see you all over there. Thank you so much, everybody. Have an awesome night. I'll see you on Discord.